Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. Uh, I am your host, Ricky Camilleri. The lives of a group of friends are thrown into chaos when one of their own commits suicide. As the group searches for a reason behind the sudden death, they begin to question their own marriages, friendships, and careers. This is the story behind ABC's dramatic, sometimes funny, heartbreaking, tearful new show, A Million Little Things. Let's take a look. You're not gonna believe this. John killed himself. How does this happen? Why did he do this? It makes no sense. He should be here. The truth is that we don't talk. I had no idea that he was depressed. Did you? Did you? I went to see her. I mean, what do you say to the woman who just lost the love of her life? You are stronger than all of us combined. Maybe John's death is a wake-up call. How does a man who beat cancer not see that maybe there is a reason that things happen? We got you. Come on. How could I not see it? We're here for you. As bad as this seems, there is good, and you will find it. I promise. A million little things. Put your hands together from Stephanie Shostak and Ron Livingston. You play John. I play John. So did you sign on to the show, and then you get there, and they're like, little rewrite, you die. Uh, yeah, no, it's after they saw me shoot the first scene. They said, hang on a sec, we'll be right back. Uh, no, that was, that was the deal signing on. And uh, yeah, it was part of what attracted me, actually, to the, to the show. Because uh, it's a chance to, uh, to tell um, the story of a character. Kind of, You have to do it very essentially, because uh, you know, I basically get one scene and a bunch of flashbacks. So uh, it's, um, you know, that's a fun challenge. But what's exciting about those flashbacks is that, uh, yes, you are the character in the, in the present of the one scene who kills himself, and everybody's wondering why. You know, what could be going wrong? How did we not see it? And my hope as a viewer, having seen the, the first episode, is that those flashbacks are going to sort of slowly, subtly reveal where the cracks were in, in this guy's uh, seemingly perfect facade. Yeah, that's definitely a part of the structure. There's a mystery element that we're going to get deeper and deeper and peel away layers of that onion. Um, but to me, the heart and soul of the of the show is not with the character at all. It's the it's the rest of the you know it's everybody else you can see and how they respond. And uh, uh, obviously, it's the pilot and and it's when the suicide happens. So uh, everybody's world is rocked. But it it really very pretty quickly becomes about where do we go from here and what does this mean for our lives and and uh, and and what does this tell us about the who we thought we were and the relationships that we thought we had versus what do we really know about each other it's definitely you play uh john's wife who i mean clearly as we as we kind of said the show is more about going forward your character and the other characters still living your character dealing with this with this tragedy what did you think when you first got the script uh i was really moved by the script because of the whole friendship aspect of it and all these these eight characters who've known each other for a very long time and all they've gone through it made me think of my own uh group of friends and i was also i really loved the humor in it that um felt very real. It actually reminded me of my dad, who, when we go through, you know, when we've gone through grief or uh, really bad times in our lives, when and he uses humor and makes the most inappropriate joke. And James Rode's character is kind of that guy, and I, I really love that. It felt very grounded and very real to me. How, uh, how early were you guys in terms of signing on to the cast? Because it is a, a big a really great big cast, and what is that like to sort of watch it assemble around you after you've signed on, or to come on after you've already, after it's already assembled? I feel like it was put together, uh, you know, I, I, I thought I was the last piece of the puzzle, but uh, Stephanie says she was, so <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't know, I thought I, I, the memo they sent said you were doing it, maybe you were still, they were oh, still doing no, the you, deal. That's true, actually, you're right, because we were actually shooting, and I remember, you're right, you're right, and I, I said it to Ricky Blit. I was like, I think Ron's going to, and he was like, what? And I thought, uh-oh, I've spoken too quickly. <laughs> you're not allowed to tell each other those things on set? 
Uh, well, it wasn't official yet, so you should yeah, never I deal, say. I don't think the deal was closed. Yeah. So. Now, I think as you said at the beginning of this conversation, that's the pilot, and we're in this period of time right now where uh, it's the beginning of the fall, all of these pilots are airing, and me as an interviewer, I'm watching a lot of pilots. Uh, but shows generally, 90% of the time, are better after the pilot. Absolutely. Can you talk about that a little bit? That's yeah. not to say that this pilot, this is a great, I mean, when it comes to pilots, this is a great pilot. Yeah. Uh, but shows generally because showrunners and everybody figure things out after that first pilot is done. I mean, obviously everybody, you know, everybody kind of gets up to speed. Um, but the other thing is just what's, what's, what you have to do for a pilot that you don't have to do for other shows. You've got to introduce all the characters. Uh, we got to tell every, you know, this is everyone's name. We got to give a nutshell of who they are so you remember. We have to set this all up. And then we, with whatever time left, we're going to try and tell you a story that's going to give you an idea of what the show is going to be about. What I love about the architecture of this show is by just starting right away with the big rock in the pond, um, we, we learn about what, the, what these people are going through before we've met them, before we know who they are. And there's something about some, uh, when something, when an event like that happens in your life, it kind of cracks you wide open. So we meet these people at their rawest and, uh, and most vulnerable. Stephanie? Um, yeah, I, I also think that as it's, it's such a bombshell, and so it's very heavy, the pilot. And uh, as it goes on, there's a lot of lighter moments, and you get to really know these characters. So you, you're... Yeah, DJ comes from, he comes from comedy. He's like has experience doing stand-up. This is his first dramatic, dramatic series. So uh, he's not really constrained by the things that you're supposed to do in a uh, drama that has, you know, serious themes. I think uh, there's always a trap of, like, um, kind of wallowing in it. You know, let's, like, let's just enjoy the... Uh, his instincts are the opposite. Um, he goes straight for the gallows humor. Uh, he, he deals with sort of people who want their lives to be light, light and funny have to deal with events that are grown-up problems that are not light and funny, and and it's in that clash I think that the that we get the tone of our show, as and it does unfold throughout the season. Was that something that attracted you? Because if it was just tears and tragedy all the time, I think that'd be pretty hard to, pretty hard to pull off. Yeah, I mean I, that's uh, that's kind of like the classic uh, soap opera formula. Um, where tears and tragedy. Tears and tragedy, and you know exactly how people are going to respond to these, you know situations. Uh, I, I think the one thing DJ wants to do is just, he wants to be constantly surprising the audience with what they're watching. Um, he just likes to be surprising us, and, and the actors as well. Now you two play uh, a married couple, I mean, in the, in the past, you're a widow as we're dealing with the, the characters in the present. Um, obviously, you're, the way that I would imagine the flashbacks are going to work is that we immediately are dropped into emotional moments or significant moments within this couple's life, what is it like kind of just doing those scenes and not kind of any of the scenes in between that you would normally have in a, in a narrative? Um, it felt really natural. I was actually a little bit nervous because we didn't, we didn't know each other and you have to be, to sort of portray this ease with one another. And, and some of the scenes were just domestic scenes and of everyday life and it felt, really natural and easy. We have kids, too, in the show, and the whole thing played beautifully and, and, and real. The daughter was what got me in the pilot, by the way. You asked She's me if there's what brought the incredible. tears to my eyes. It was the daughter. I was, yeah, I not. Yeah. That's not allowed. I can't have that in front of me. I'll just cry. Kids and funerals, too much for Do me. you have a daughter? No, I don't. But if I did, I think I'd cry every day. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'd be able to handle anything like that. Um, what was it like for you? You you guys have you have children, right? Mm -hmm. What was it like for you watching a scene like that in the pilot? I mean, and it, it, able to detach yourself, or do you? Yeah, I I, uh, I I am to a certain extent. Although it's where it really gets me is when I'm reading it on the page. When yeah. we get the new script, uh, I mean, I read. I, I, I was balling and at 106 and 107. I'm not even in them, you know, but I'm just reading what's happening to the characters and I, I'm like, oh, I gotta get a Kleenex. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's, uh, there's something about having kids that uh, really makes you feel uh, what a, uh, you know, the, 
the damage that, that suicide can do. It's one thing to uh, give up on your own life. Uh, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, um, because I mean it in the way of, of somebody who's sometimes drowning and uh, can't seem to get anyone's attention to get the help they need. Um, and it's one thing to, you know, to uh, uh, drop out of your spouse's life. But uh, with, when kids are in the picture, it's just, it's so tragic. Um, you know, you have another show that's uh, that's coming back, right? In a couple, in a few weeks, Louder Milk. Yes. And uh, a completely different kind of character. Very right? different. Like I, I haven't seen it yet, but if this character is a mess, and we're going to slowly reveal that he's a mess, Louder Milk is I'm a mess on the surface, on, on the surface, yeah. and look at me. The polar opposites. Yeah. Um, you know, John is sort of like gregarious and and charming, and people like him, and and Louder Milk hates everybody, and Pretty much everybody hates him, and he likes it that way. He doesn't want any friends. Um, we have a we have a quick clip. Let's take a look at it. Louder milk, and we'll, we'll come back for a second. We have a wonderful work of art, a 1962 painting done by Joan Neri. This is a two-owner painting, originally commissioned by William Beauchene of Newport, Rhode Island. We are starting the bidding at $22,000. We have talking about investing in some art. We have twenty-three. Yeah, I heard you might have a good deal on a Danish Schutz. What do you think I'm doing here? I'm here to see you. Please just keep it down. Hey, if you wanted to talk to me, you could have done it somewhere that's not my job. Well, you know, I'm not much of a planner, more of a seat of the pants guy, and all that, you know. So, how are you? I, I thought that was fun. Other month. It's been a month. Is that a, is that a mud honey shirt that he's wearing? It is. Yeah, it's a mud honey shirt. Yeah, good eye. Who good picked, is that, eye. Are you a mud honey fan, or is that the costume designers? Is that the, the character? Costume, it's probably the, sh the shirt that cleared. Right. <laughs> like it needs to be a band. This is the band that we get that that's not going to sue us. Yeah. There, although there's, he's supposed to be a rock and roll critic. You know, he's an ex rock and roll critic with a very particular taste. So I think, uh, you know, Pete Fairley. Um, it was very specific about the kind, you know, the bands that were on the list and the bands that weren't. Now, um, Louder Milk is a show that you do like ten episodes of, right? Yes. And uh, is a million little pieces? Is that set for like a, a 12, 10 or twelve episode run, or would it be like a twenty-two? Right now, it's thirteen, and I think then they'll announce pretty soon if it's going to go to eighteen. Wow, thirteen to eighteen. What is it like doing a show that is ten episodes versus doing one that's eighteen? I mean, it's such a different animal, uh, and uh, it's especially different because Louder Milk's a half-hour show. We do an episode every four days. Uh, a Million Little Things, we do an episode every 10 days? Eight. Eight. Yeah. Eight, eight shooting days? 40, 44 minutes, yeah. Or 40 uh, minutes. Yeah, something, 40, something, yeah. Something, something like that. An hour good. with commercials. Um, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, hour plus. With, uh, you know, so it's a different animal, but I... Uh, I, I, I just have a different function. Louder Milk, I'm kind of wall to wall on it. Uh, it's kind of my day gig. And, uh, you know, and uh, there's one show where I'm alive and there's one show where I'm dead. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, they have different uh, requirements of my time. A version of Alive version with Louder Milk. Yeah. Yes. Alive uh, memory. So, you're do, so you're doing one episode every eight days, you said? Is that an intense amount of work? Um, you know, the, it's an ensemble show, so we actually, our schedule is, we, I can't complain. We, uh, we don't work every single day. None of us work every single day. It's, it's pretty, pretty well. great. Yeah. It gets spread around, uh, you know, amongst the big cast. No, I have to ask, without revealing anything um, from, uh, from the first episode, when you read the script and read where it went with your character, what was your first thought without revealing anything? I was going to make a joke, but I think the joke would have revealed. <laughs> um, she's a she's a bit of a hot mess, and I like that. But she's also a clue into what was going on with him in the sense that he seemed like someone who wasn't a hot mess at all, but maybe yeah, and everybody I think that's, was. That's what DJ Nash says. It's whenever you think you know someone and who they are, you're going to find out pretty quickly that it's not what you thought. One of the things that I was really struck by with the pilot was that as much as uh, I think on, on most shows or most stories would have the suicide happen and that would throw everybody into tumult, tumult but, and chaos. But with this, they're already kind of all pretty fucked up from the beginning. 
Like there's an opening montage where sure you're the one that dies, but everybody else is kind of on the verge on the verge of their own emotional or literal death as well. Absolutely. If if anything, I think uh, you know the loss of this of this character in the in the in the middle of things uh, kind of wakes everybody up uh, in a way that it does. You know, they they're cracked wide open and they have to um, come to grips with with their own lives and and. You know, and with what they're sharing with each other, which uh, they discover is not as much as they think. Do you uh, do you miss not being able to be on the show as much as everybody else in the in the ensemble regularly? I mean, uh, practically, uh, obviously, I'd love to be I'd love to be there in the trenches, but uh, it just doesn't work that way. Kevin Costner didn't even get to say anything, and you know, <laughs> when he when he did this gig, um, so anything I get is good. Uh, but I mean, honestly, if there was, if I was there any more, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it because of the commitment to the other show. So it's it made, came together perfectly. Well, let's get some questions from our audience. Uh, who has a question right here? Hi, um, I know you guys worked on Dinner for Schmucks together. Hey, good eye. I love. There you I lo go. Yeah, I just realized that too. Um, was that the first time you guys worked together, and have your cro have your paths crossed since then to now? That was the first time, but we'd never worked together. We before. didn't meet until the premiere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think at the premiere I came up to tell you how great you were. But, uh, uh, yeah, we were in different sides of that story. Um, yeah. You were in the middle, and I was off to the edge. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but good eye. Yeah. One more. What do we got right here? Um, hi. Um, I was lucky enough to see the pilot. Uh, the Paley Center does a screening of a whole bunch of pilots before the season starts. And I loved the show. I cried and laughed. And um, I really like the parts where the family is, you know, um, doing their routine things because you just can't be devastated 24-7. Mm -hmm. And um, I got to thinking by the end, you know, unfairly or whatever, they, they put you on a pedestal, all of them. That's why it's so devastating. But with friends like these, <laughs> who needs, you know, by the end, of, I'm seeing what everybody was up to and how flawed they are. I, I don't know. Yeah. At the end, I, were you like, it's their fault that he's dead? Because I was. <laughs> I was like, these guys killed him. Oh, I didn't want to think, I didn't want to think that. I, I think that's very perceptive, especially the part about the pedestal. Uh, and I think that John was probably complicit in putting himself on a pedestal. And uh, there's something about the people who are trying to curate the image uh, of their life that I think they're especially susceptible uh, when things come along and start to come off track uh, of not wanting to share that because they, they feel like they have too much to lose. Um, so I, I think that's definitely part of the mystery that, that we're going to kind of uncover as, as we go into it. Well done. well done, both of you. Thank you. Thank is, you. Is that something that you're that you address with your character as well, as sort of being married to someone who puts themselves up on a on a pedestal and everybody else puts up on a pedestal? Yes, and I think Delilah n never wanted to share any of this either because she knew that how her husband was sort of everybody's number one and the most generous, and he's the one. He's the, the reason why this friendship between the four guys started in the first place. And she recognizes that, you know, he's also their everything. He's the planner, the provider, the, he, that nobody knows what their, nobody knows what, who, what anybody's marriage is behind closed door. And um, she didn't want to share that with anyone. Um, guys, congratulations on the show. It's beautiful on both shows. Um, a Million Little Things comes uh, to ABC uh, tomorrow night for its premiere, and Loudermilk returns uh, in October? October 16th, Tuesday nights at 10. All right, everybody give a big round of applause for Ron and Stephanie. Let's hear it. <laughs>